it can be a very chastening thing to see how changeable our minds are. You make up your mind, you're going to do something, and then you find yourself just a few minutes later heading off in another direction. And sometimes it's because you saw that your original intention was not as wise as you thought it was, but many times it has nothing to do with that at all. The original intention was perfectly fine. And you're off-headed at right angles to that intention. And you sometimes wonder why. One of the purposes of meditation is to see exactly what's happening. Why you can suddenly veer, veer off at right angles. Exactly what the mind does to itself in order to drop an intention, a perfectly good intention, and go someplace else. In this way, the meditation is like an experiment. Focus on something you know is good, the breath. After all, the breath is the force of life. And it's something very immediate. It's not far off or dubious. It's something right here, right now. And you can see that by sticking with the breath, and allowing the breath to be comfortable, it's bound to have a good effect on the body and the mind. So there's no doubt there. And by setting up the breath as your, as your focus, as the object of your intention, the next step is to be aware of any other vagrant intentions that will pull you off someplace else. And for the time being, the rule in your mind is if it doesn't have anything to do with the breath, you don't want to get involved. So as soon as you find yourself veering off, you don't have to ask a lot of questions. If you're getting pulled away from the breath, just drop whatever that thought formation was and come back to the breath. No matter how interesting or intriguing or important or compelling that thought may be, just let it go. Leave it in mid-sentence. You don't have to tie up any loose ends. You don't have to make a little note to come back there. Just totally drop it and come back. Now you find that the after echo of that thought formation may continue in the mind for a while. That's okay. You don't have to go there. Your job right now is to train the mind to be more and more consistent in sticking with an intention. And sure enough, a second thought will come up, or a third, or a fourth, or a tenth, or a hundredth. But no matter what, you're not going to go there. That's the promise you make yourself when you sit down. And the important thing is not to get discouraged when you find yourself breaking that promise. Just pick yourself up, dust yourself off, and get back to the breath. Because this is a deeply ingrained habit that we're fighting here. If you think training a dog is difficult, well, look at the human mind. It's very difficult to train the human mind in this way. But it can be done, and the time spent and training yourself into habits like this is time well spent. Because after all, the force of intention is what shapes your life. We don't often think of the teachings of karma of having much relevance to the meditation. Sometimes we're even taught that karma was one of those weird pieces of cultural baggage that somehow got carried over with Buddhism or brought into Buddhism from its cultural background. 
That's not the case at all. The Buddha had some very specific teachings on karma that had nothing to do with what anybody else was teaching at the time. And they're immediately relevant to why we're meditating and how we meditate. The why has to do with that point I just raised, that given that intention has a huge shaping force in your life, you want to have some control over it. If you make up your mind to do something you know is good, you want to be able to stick with it. And where does intention happen? It happens right in the present moment. This is why we focus on the present moment. So we can see the process of action, of intention, as it happens, and can have a say in where that intention is going to go. The more solidly you can stay in the present moment, the more you can maintain your balance here, the more you'll be able to see, and the more conscience, conscious say you'll have in the direction of where those intentions are going to take you. That's the why. As for the how, one of the things you'll notice as things come up in the meditation is that these vagrant intentions have to do have very little to do with anything you were consciously thinking about. Before you sat down to meditate, when you made your intention to stay with the breath, and yet suddenly they appear. That has to do with the Buddha's teachings on how your present experience is shaped from three things the results of past intentions, the actual process of intention in the present moment, and immediate results from that present intention. So certain thoughts are going to come up as a result of past intentions. It doesn't necessarily have much meaning, it's just that they happen to pop up and be pretty random. We often look for inspiration or signs that there's some special knowledge it's going to come out of the mind when we meditate. Well, that can happen, but you find that it's also mixed up with a lot of really random stuff. It's like looking for meaning in your dreams. Some dreams are pretentious. Some dreams are pretentious. Some dreams are just totally random. You can't take them as a guide. And in the same way, what pops into your mind in the present moment, you can't necessarily take that as a guide either. But what you can do when you put yourself in the present moment and learn how to stay solidly with your intention to stay with the breath, is over time you put yourself in a better position to evaluate what comes into the mind. The thought of greed, anger, and delusion comes in, you'll be able to sense it because you're more sensitive when you stay here. Insights come up, but it's not necessary that you have to memorize them. And John Fuang once said that if an insight is really valuable, you're not going to have to take note of, oh, this is a valuable idea. See if you can apply it to the, what's actually happening to your mind in the present moment. And if it gives good results, stick with it. If it doesn't, just drop it. In other words, if it's a really valuable insight, it'll stick with you without your having to tag it, put it on a leash, and carry it back, carry it back home with you. The insights are not nearly as important as the ability to put the mind in a position where it can produce insights and where it can evaluate your insights. That's what we do as we get the mind in concentration and try to be very, very alert to cause and effect here in the present moment. When you can see the connection between cause and effect, that's when you're in a position to evaluate your thoughts, because the worth of a thought is in its effect. It's like having a goose that lays golden eggs. You really want to take good care of the goose, because these golden eggs we get, they're, they're like the golden fairy tales. 
If you don't use them right away or give them away right away, they turn into feathers or they turn into charcoal. The more you try to hold on to things, remember fairy tales? The more you try to hold on to things, the, the more they turn into straw. If you get something good, you give it away, you use it right then and there. And you've gained its value. It's the same with insights. If it's appropriate for the time and the place, fine, use it. If not, just put it aside. It probably wasn't an insight anyhow. Because as I said, all kinds of things can come popping up into a still mind. But the value of a still mind is not so much what pops up, but your ability to evaluate what pops up. You can see cause and effect when the mind is really still and very refined. It can sense the presence of greed, anger, and delusion, even in minor quantities, because your powers of sensitivity are raised. Your ability to see cause and effect is sharpened. You can tell genuine gold from fool's gold a lot better when the mind is still. So it's not that you have to trust whatever comes up in the still mind, but you're not supposed to trust anything. You're supposed to put it to the test. But the value here is that you really can see. You can gauge your intentions a lot better when the basic underlying intention of the mind is reliable, is solid. The basic underlying intention is this, to do, do always what is the most skillful thing. Always choose what is going to be the least harmful, the most beneficial. And one of the most beneficial things you can do for yourself is to learn how to stick with a very simple, good intention like this, like staying with the breath. You get more and more reliable in staying there. That provides the foundation for all the other insights and all the other good things that come out of training the mind. So make sure the foundation is strong. Make sure the foundation is solid. And the good things you develop and build on top of that are not going to topple over.